So much to do, so little time, Congress scrambles to finish work before the August recess. A deadly virus forces the Peace Corps from three West African nations. Catholic missionaries stay to care for the sick. Franciscans join summer merchants. Their stand along Rome's Tiber River stands out. And home to the islands, the remains of St. Mary Ann Cope are returned to her beloved Hawaii. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, July 31st, 2014. Good evening from Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Brian Patrick. And looking at your news now, a frantic last day at the Capitol as Congress now goes on a five-week break. Our Jason Calvi covers today's final legislative push from the Hill. Jason? Brian, so many issues on the agenda today. Fixing the problem at the VA, funding our roads, but first of all, the children crossing our border. And today the House leadership decided not to have a vote on this issue. The president is asking Congress for $3.7 billion to handle the surge of young people crossing our border. The gentleman's time has expired. Today, the House debated a $659 million package to deal with the crisis. The Senate is considering a $2.7 billion bill to address the border problem. Speaker Boehner criticized the Senate proposal this morning. The House will not take up the Senate immigration reform bill or accept it back from the Senate in any fashion, including in this border bill nor will we accept any attempt to add uh, other immigration reform issues or anything like it, including the DREAM Act, uh, to the House's border bill. The House voted on party lines to sue the president yesterday. On this vote, the yeas are 225, the nays are 201. The suit accuses the president of going over his constitutional authority when he made changes to the Affordable Care Act. Congressional lawsuits against presidents are rare. In 2008, the Democrat-controlled House sued the Bush administration. That suit was dropped after an agreement was reached. A Republican-controlled House, Democratic-controlled Senate, and last-minute finger-pointing today. Uh, are a mess on the floor of the House. Yesterday we spoke to you about uh, the fact that the Republicans do not have time to raise the minimum wage, but they have time to sue the President of the United States. Listen, there are 352 bills passed by the House sitting in the United States Senate. Almost all of those bills have passed the House on a bipartisan basis. Go, go take your complaint to Harry Reid. But there's still time for foes to get together around the same table in the White House to discuss foreign policy. And Speaker John Boehner issued a statement today saying that the House leadership was going to continue to be working on this pressing issue. Brian? All right, Jason Calvi on Capitol Hill. And to help us take a look at this final flurry of congressional activity, we have Elaine K. Mark from the Brookings Institution, also Brian Tremail with the leading National Trade Association for the Construction Industry to talk about the highway bill. First of all, Elaine, Congress has been in gridlock. Why not just say, you stay until you get this done? Keep them after school. <laughs> well, I hope that they, in fact, do that. Yeah, and, they I and they might. And I suspect that people are so outraged that they are leaving town without doing something about these children at the border, that there may be enough pressure to keep them in town and keep them working at least until they get something to resolve that one issue. This is a pretty dysfunctional Congress, however, and this is a big embarrassment for the Speaker of the House. The, you mentioned the immigration bill. Does this show that the Tea Party has more influence maybe than we thought, the fact that this is not going anywhere? Uh, the, the Tea Party controls the Republican Party. What I don't understand is how the Republican leadership let this happen, how they managed to get into a situation where a minority of the party is dictating what happens to them. There was a point in this debate where the bill was at about $1.5 billion, where, in fact, they would have gotten some Democratic votes for it. But this leadership, and I think this is about the leadership more than about the Tea Party, this leadership is unable to create the bipartisan coalitions on individual votes that used to happen in the United States Congress all the time. I'm sure some would agree with you. Many would also disagree. I want to turn to the highway bill. And, Brian, your organization, very interested in seeing this pass. But why does it matter to us, normal Americans who drive every day, by the way. Yeah, well, 
the, the challenge with this, this funding fight about highways in, in, in Washington is that if the Congress doesn't figure out how we're going to pay for our roads and bridge repairs for the next several months, then the amount of money going to states is going to get cut back by the U.S. Department of Transportation. And that means that road repair projects across the country are going to come to a stop. I was in Cleveland yesterday at the Interbelt Project, biggest highway project in Ohio, and they said that they're going to have to shut off work on that project if Congress can't pass a, a temporary highway funding measure by really by the end of today. Uh, and, and what that means is there'll be jobs lost, but more importantly, if you're driving on a highway, you want to take a summer break, you're going to be dodging potholes, you're going to be weaving around orange cones, and the roads you drive on are, are going to be in worse shape because we're going to miss the, the a summer construction season. And in many parts of the country, you can't work on the roads in the winter because it's too cold. This is, this is the height of the season, and if we can't figure out how to fund the roads, then all that repair work is going to come to a halt, and, and all those potholes from the rough winter we had on the East Coast are going to stay there a little longer. So this is short term. We're not talking about long-term highway funding. This, we're talking about jobs that are started and going right now. That's right. Uh, it, what happened is that the, the federal government pays for road repairs through what's known as the Highway Trust Fund, the Federal Highway Trust Fund. And that trust fund is set to, to hit a dangerously low amount of money sometime in early August. And that will force the Department of Transportation to slow down how much money it reimburses to states for road repairs. That translates in English to states are going to have to tell contractors to stop working because they're going to run out of money to reimburse contractors for the job. All right, we're going to see what happens or doesn't happen. Finally, Elaine, does this look like we are basically have a, a Congress that's going to do nothing up to the uh, elections, or is, is there hope that something it, can happen? It kind of depends on what happens when they go home in August for the August recess. It sort of depends on what kind of reaction they get from the voters about mm. what they've been doing. So some of them are going to hear, yes, yeah, stand by your principles, don't compromise. And others are going to say, hey, guys, we sent you there to solve problems. And it's going to depend on what they hear in this next month as to whether or not when they come back in September they're going to get down to business, do some negotiating, and uh, actually pass a few bills. We'll see what happens. Elaine Carmack, thank you, and Brian Termill, we appreciate you being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Now some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. U.S. stocks plunge today, wiping out July's gains and giving the market its first monthly loss since January. The Dow Jones Industrial Average finished 317 points lower, the worst daily drop in six months. The slide interrupted a prolonged bull market. Investigators responded to weak earnings reports and escalating political instability in the world. And there are also concerns about the likely end of the Federal Reserve stimulus program, all leading to a rough day for investors. The Wisconsin Supreme Court upholds a 2011 state law to end collective bargaining for most public workers in that state. Anger over that law led to an unsuccessful attempt to recall Republican Governor Scott Walker. The court upheld the law today, five to two. It was challenged by the Madison Teachers Union and a union representing Milwaukee public workers. The unions argued the law violates workers' constitutional rights to free assembly and equal protection. Israel's military is calling up thousands more reservists to bolster its forces in the fight against Hamas in Gaza. The military says 16,000 additional reservists are being called. That would bring the number of active Israeli troops to 86,000. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says his country will complete its goal of destroying Hamas's network of tunnels. We've neutralized dozens of terror tunnels and we are determined to complete that mission with or without a ceasefire. I will not accept any ceasefire proposal that prevents the IDF from completing the task of demolishing the tunnels, which is crucial to the security of the people of Israel. Close to 1,300 Palestinians, mostly civilians, have now died. 59 Israelis, mainly soldiers, have been killed in this latest violence. Meanwhile, the U.N. is accusing Israel and Hamas militants of committing war crimes. The U.N. Security Council held an emergency session to discuss Wednesday's attack on a U.N. school that sheltered thousands of Palestinians. The panel heard impassioned pleas from top U.N. officials. But over 103 U.N. facilities have come under attack, including an UNRWA school hosting over 3,300 displaced yesterday. 19 people were killed and over a hundred injured. The United Nations has lost seven staff and other humanitarian workers have been killed since the outbreak of hostilities. The reality of Gaza today is that no place is safe.
UN officials appealed for a greater effort to protect civilians and to let much needed aid reach Gaza. Well, two weeks after the downing of Malaysia Airlines Flight 17, an investigation team has finally reached the crash site in Ukraine for the first time. The Ukraine announced it would stop military action near the crash site for one day. Dutch investigators reached the plane debris and were able to collect DNA samples from 25 of the victims. The initial focus is on retrieving the victims' remains and their belongings. This hopefully brings the families of the victims just one step closer to the healing process. An American bishop is urging the U.S. government to listen to bishops in Central America. Bishop Richard Pates says the bishops of El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala would rather have economic help from the U.S. than military aid. The bishops also asked the United States to recognize its contributions to the violent drug trade through drug abuse and unregulated gun experts or exports. Bishop Pates tells EWTN News Nightly the bishops are well aware of the need for reform. The tone of the bishops in Central America are recognizing the crisis. Uh, secondly, it's a long-term crisis that it didn't develop overnight. Uh, the, thirdly, they want to work with us to develop uh, a resolution to it. But I think it's both of our country, all of, all of our countries are working together to come up with a resolution that really respects the dignity of man and built on social justice. Bishop Pate's talking with us on Skype. He detailed the bishop's concerns to Secretary of State John Kerry in a letter dated July 24th. The Archbishop of St. Paul in Minneapolis will not resign in the midst of a sex abuse claims in his archdiocese, saying he will stay as long as Pope Francis wants. Today, Archbishop John Neinstead released a column on the Catholic Spirit website in his archdiocese addressing the clergy sex abuse allegations. His three main points. One, I have created a new leadership team that operates under the philosophy of victims first. Two, I have never knowingly covered up clergy sexual abuse. And three, I have always been honest with the Catholics of this local church. Archbishop Neinstead goes on to say, I have heard about the pain of being ignored by the church from victims of sexual abuse and their families. I have heard from the parishioners and families of priests I have removed from ministry. And I have prayed, oh, how I have prayed. Pope Francis will make an apostolic voyage to Albania in September. It will be the second visit of a pope to Albania. St. John Paul II went there in 1993. Pope Francis's trip will begin with a welcoming ceremony at Tirana's Mother Teresa International Airport. He will be greeted there by the Albanian Prime Minister. He will celebrate Mass in Mother Teresa Square and then pray the Angelus with the faithful who have gathered. A Sudanese woman who faced death for refusing to renounce her Christian faith is moving to the United States. Miriam Ibrahim visited Pope Francis last week with her family after finally being allowed to leave Sudan. Her departure was initially blocked after Sudan's highest court overturned her death sentence in June. Ibrahim's father was Muslim, her mother an Orthodox Christian. Her new home will be in Manchester, New Hampshire, where her Christian husband once lived. Coming up, Catholic missionaries fill the void as the Peace Corps pulls out of countries hit by the deadly Ebola virus. And they have nothing to sell but everything to give. These Franciscans join summer merchants along Rome's Tiber River. A gentle reminder tonight from the official Twitter feed of Pope Francis. May each family rediscover family prayer, which helps to bring about mutual understanding and forgiveness. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick on EWTN News Nightly, and the death toll is now more than 700 in West Africa due to the spread of the deadly Ebola virus. Volunteer groups are now worried the highly contagious disease could spread further. Wyatt Goolsby is with us covering these latest developments. Wyatt? Brian, the Peace Corps is in the process of pulling out hundreds of its volunteers from th for three different African countries and bringing them back here to the U.S. Their volunteer, two of their volunteers are still in isolation in Africa after they were exposed to Ebola. But the spread of the virus now has many worried it might spread here via air travel. Today, a travel warning from the U.S. for the three African countries hit by an Ebola outbreak, Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. Officials are advising Americans not to travel to those countries if you don't have to. There's a possibility of somebody flying in from Africa or someplace. Liberia has shut down some of its borders and closed all of its schools. As two American workers stricken with Ebola are showing signs of improvement, the Christian organizations they work for are evacuating all non-essential personnel out of that country. The pastor of one of those infected Christian missionaries, Nancy Wrightbull, praised her character. 
They are low profile, uh, unassuming people, what I would describe as the salt of the earth. Uh, we are very proud uh, to have such people like this as missionaries. While many organizations are pulling volunteers out of Africa, some groups like Catholic Relief Services are staying put. Today, Michael Stuhlman talked with News Nightly via Skype from Freetown in Sierra Leone. We really feel that it's important to have solidarity with people of Sierra Leone. And also, because we've been there for so long, we have developed a lot of trusted relationships. The president of Sierra Leone, seen here praying for victims, has declared a state of emergency. Stolman says CRS is keeping close track to their personnel's health and safety. One of the biggest issues volunteers are dealing with on the ground is educating the public about the seriousness of the outbreak. A lot of people don't know what Ebola is or they don't believe it exists. What we're doing right now is collaborating very closely with local leaders and community elders, religious leaders. We're training them so that they can raise awareness in their community about Ebola in a more culturally acceptable way. Health officials with the Centers for Disease Control say at this point the Ebola outbreak is largely limited to West Africa, but Brian, authorities are screening travelers going inbound and outbound of those three countries. Thank you, Wyatt Goolsby. And the missionaries of Africa, or the White Fathers, are active in 22 African countries where they set up schools and health facilities. Father Pedro Sala decries war, having witnessed the beginning of the Rwandan genocide in the mid-90s. War is something very horrible. People who speak of war and haven't lived it like I have, it's difficult for them to understand it if they haven't lived it like I have. That sensation of destroying life, that sensation that life isn't worth anything, that you are an object, it's a blind destruction. The bullets don't have eyes. The missionaries of Africa are commonly called the White Fathers because of their white habits. Well, each summer, Romans set up little stands with shops and bars and restaurants and ice cream stands along the Tiber River. This year, there's a special new stand which stands out. It's run by Franciscans. They celebrate Sunday Mass under one of the bridges along the river. They serve food to the poor of the area. They hear confessions. Eight parish priests of the neighborhood help out. The goal is a presence of witness, nothing else. We don't sell anything. It isn't an exposition of missionary objects. It's just about being among the people. So we prefer personal contact and dialogue. After 90 days of work at the Tiber River, the missionaries will meet with Pope Francis and give him a collection of thoughts on missionary work, essentially written by the people they have served. Up next, what you're drinking to quench your thirst could be zapping your energy for summer fun. We bring you the facts. And St. Marianne is back home. Her remains are relocated from New York to Hawaii, where she cared for those with leprosy. On Thursday, July 31st, this is EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick. Thanks for joining us tonight. An investigation shows flaws behind the healthcare.gov site rollout. After a month-long study, the Government Accountability Office found the Obama administration lacked effective planning or oversight practices. It could have cost Americans millions. The website healthcare.gov was a portal for millions of uninsured Americans to enroll in the Affordable Care Act. So the crux of the issue here is uh, uh, we'll, we'll investigate that with our, our guests. Bill Woods of the U.S. Government Accountability Office is lead author of the study, and James Capretta is a health care policy expert from Ethics and Public Policy Center. Bill, you dealt with contracting on this issue. So if contractors don't have a clear idea of what they're supposed to do, it looks pretty obvious that that's going to mess up the rollout. Is that what happened? That's absolutely correct, Brian. Uh, we looked at three issues that we think uh, all contributed to the uh, um, problems with the rollout. Uh, one is the uh, planning that went into that effort. Secondly is oversight. And thirdly was contractor performance. And we found issues in each of those three areas. And let me just explain briefly. In the uh, uh, planning area, um, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, used um, uh, a variety of, pr of approaches to get things done quickly. They were facing an October 1st deadline, and they used uh, cost reimbursement contracts. They proceeded uh, before requirements were fully uh, defined, uh, and they used a, uh, uh, an, a development approach um, uh, that they're not normally used to using. 
all of those issues created risks, and they did not adequately plan for those risks. Yeah, and we watched this develop, and it was clear that it was not working very well. What do you think this cost us in terms of, you know, the taxpayers' money that went into what really was a pretty botched attempt at doing something that should have been done right? Well, the report itself documents that a number of the contracts had to be plussed up to try to get some of the work cleaned up. So there was at least a hundred, you know, a couple hundred million dollars in. Uh, dollars spent on taxpayer money that was wasted. I think the big issue here is that the federal government is just not very good at big contracts related to information technology. There's been a number of failures going back a couple of decades, many of them documented well by GAO. But it's a, it's a problem in part because the government doesn't have great in-house expertise on the IT issues, plus managing these big contracts can be very faulty. But Bill, certainly the government has tons of experience with contractors because so much of its work is done with contracting. Is it because this is a, a relatively new area for the government dealing in? Uh, this was a uh, uh, first of its kind un undertaking. So that um, uh, definitely added to the complexity uh, here. And the uh, uh, oversight uh, areas that we looked at, uh, the tools were available to see CMS to use to provide oversight of its contractors, but they simply weren't used. They had um, a quality assurance plan in place, not used. They had uh, oversight and governance boards, and those uh, boards proceeded without sufficient information. So oversight was not what it should have been. Well, we appreciate you being able to give us so much detail about the actual report that you actually worked on. Finally, James, I just wonder if this will be taken seriously. What do you think is going to be the reaction to this? I'm sure there'll be plenty from opponents of the president's health care law. How do you think the White House will react to the report? Well, I think they're reacting like they normally have, which is to say we're, we're fixing these problems and promising that, you know, the next round will be addressed in a better way. I think the big issue is that there are still large gaps in this information technology effort. A lot of payments are being made with a lot, without a lot of good checks and balances in the system. So money is probably being spent right now that's uh, you know, going to be coming at the uh, cost to taxpayers. All right. James Capretta, Bill Woods, we appreci bo appreciate both of you being with us. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, Brian. Well, Congressman Eric Cantor delivered his last speech today as the House Majority Leader. He is stepping down. After losing his primary election, he spoke today about his experience in office. I have truly lived the American dream. That's what this country is supposed to be about, dreaming big, believing that each generation can do better than the last. Cantor now becomes a rank-and-file House member for the remainder of the 113th Congress. Kevin McCarthy of Texas takes over as House Majority Leader. Hot temperatures, outdoor activities, two good reasons to pay attention to proper hydration this summer. Our Katherine Zeltner reports. Whether you're at the beach or in the backyard this summer, practicing good hydration habits is essential. Paying attention to hydration during summer is going to enable you to enjoy a summer without feeling too fatigued. You get some water through foods like fruits and vegetables, but 80% of your hydration comes from water and other liquids. So brush up on your H2O IQ with this quick quiz. Here goes, true or false? Let your thirst be your guide. That's false. You want to outpace your thirst. You do not want to get thirsty. When you're thirsty, you're already mildly dehydrated. What about eight eight-ounce glasses of water a day are sufficient? That's also false. That's your bare minimum. Start off with that eight and build up from there. Aim for about nine glasses for women and 12 for men, whether it's from tap or bottled. Just because water comes out of a bottle does not mean it's safer. Next, some drinks hydrate more than others. It's true. Water is a perfect hydration policy. Stick with water. Some caffeinated beverages are okay, but be weary of alcohol. It dehydrates. Tips to help you think or rethink your drink. Katherine Zeltner, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Catherine. And finally tonight, Hawaii has its saint back on the island. St. Marianne Cope's remains arrived in Honolulu for a ceremony and mass today, relocated from New York. They recently canonized saint is known for caring for the dying saint Damien of Molokai and then continuing his work with exiled leprosy patients. Thank you for joining us tonight. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, catch us again on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Thanks for watching. Good night and God bless you.